Well, the answer is obviously yes, but it's also so much more complex than just saying that, as you can tell by the really big number at the bottom of the screen there. So, let's get to it. You want the long version or the short version? I will take the easy version, please. Oh, I want to hear the long version, but can you tell me in three parts? If you haven't watched the very first episode of Ruby in a while, I highly suggest you do so in the near future because it is insanely refreshing. It's kind of amazing how almost all of the problems I have with volumes 5 and 6 are nowhere to be found in the beginning, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with the plot structure since I've been eternally hammering on that point thus far. Prior to the fall of Beacon, Ruby's plot structure was extremely simplistic and straightforward. Aside from feeling very small and self-contained in regards to its setting, the direction in which the plot travels is remarkably simple, yet also extremely slow and deliberate. It takes half of the first volume just to finish the introductory arcs, and four and a half of the eight episodes that encompass that revolve solely around the Emerald Forest mission. Yet, at the same time, these arcs never feel overly long or like they've overstayed their welcome. This leads me to an important element of early Ruby's story structure, all of the arcs are relatively short. Until Volume 4, no major storylines last through an entire season. They're all broken up into more digestible chunks. In Volume 1, Episode 1 through the first half of Episode 4 contains small introductory stories to introduce us to the most important cast members and set up everything to come. The second half of Episode 4 through the end of Episode 8 cover the Emerald Forest mission, 9 and 10 are settling in and Ruby and Weiss arguing over Ego, 11 through 12 are the Bully Arc, and 15 and 16 end on a Blake story intertwined with one of Roman's big heists. In Volume 2, the first episode is mostly a standalone food fight plus a chance to introduce the new villain characters and their dynamic with Torchwick. 2 through 4 show Team Ruby investigating the White Fang's activity and a fight with Torchwick, 5 through 7 cover the dance, and 8 through 12 are the Mountain Glen mission and train fight. Even Volume 3 has two distinct sections. Episodes 1 through 9 cover the Vital Tournament and its untimely end, while 10 through 12 cover the Fall of Beacon and its aftermath. What's most important to note here is that there is never more than one major goal that our heroes are working towards at a single point in time, even across a long span of episodes. For example, all of the major players in the first arcs are students focused on their arrival at Beacon and their first test that will cement their their relationships with the other students around them. It's a very broad concept that allows for a wide scope and depth of exploration, but still extremely simple in what it's trying to convey. After the first fight scene in Episode 1, we don't even see Torchwick again until Episode 8 because it doesn't matter what he's doing right now. He's just off being mysterious and planning something for later. What's important is the developing relationships among the students, and Volume 1 puts almost its entire focus on just that. Volumes 2 and 3 follow a similar pattern. Figure out what the main idea is that needs to be conveyed for a given arc, and focus almost entirely on exploring that idea. There is one section of Volume 2 that does use two major plot lines at once, but we'll get into why that is a bit later. I went into such detail on the specific lengths of these arcs because it's so different from how the story is structured after the fall of Beacon. Ruby and Team Juniper traveling to Haven takes the entirety of Volume 4 to accomplish with no significant stopping points along the way, as do both Yang's and Weiss's character building arcs. Blake defeating the White Fang in Menagerie takes two volumes to complete, and the more overarching plotline of reuniting Team Ruby also takes two volumes. Volume 6 does seem to correct this a little bit with the Brunswick Farm arc and by having a clear demarcation point with the arrival at Argus, but there are still too many concurrently running plotlines for it to have much of an effect, and so it pales in comparison to the more simplistic structure of early volumes. One of the many benefits of having such a simplified story structure is that it allows more room to focus on characterization. I've heard a lot of complaints that early Ruby's characterization is too simplistic or immature, but I don't really see it that way. 
Sure, there aren't any extensive and lengthy arcs that show us deep, intricate character development, but deep and intricate was never a priority in the beginning. There seems to be this notion among some people that being more complex automatically makes something better, and I could not disagree more. Yes, I do like complexity, but some of my favorite shows are extremely simple in what they set out to do. As for what Ruby sets out to do, I think breadth would be a better word to describe it than depth. Rather than narrow in on one particular idea and explore that to the greatest extent possible, Ruby takes a more scattershot approach to what it wants to convey, as exhibited by how I laid out all the arcs. With these arcs being relatively short, the variety of situations that the characters get into increases significantly, thus allowing for different sides of a character to be exposed, or even better, for the same side to be exposed to multiple different situations where it either fares well or horribly. Case in point, You are going to die a nerd. So sad. Ruby herself makes for a great example of this. Episode 1 shows that she is a strong and fearless fighter with a lot of potential to become a great huntress, but she's also kind of a dork. A very lovable one, but a dork nonetheless. 2 and 3 show her in a non-combat situation where she's forced to be more sociable by her older sister, and each attempt ends in travesty because Ruby is extremely socially awkward. As the Emerald Forest mission begins and Ruby is forced to team up with Weiss, we see that she's not just socially awkward, but also extremely headstrong and independent, which would normally be strong traits to have, but in this instance it ends up causing more friction with Weiss, who is also also headstrong and independent, and these two very potent personalities don't work well together when it comes to teamwork. Eventually, their interactions throughout this mission do lead them to a point where they can put aside their egos for just a little bit so they can work together. 9 and 10 show Ruby officially in a leadership role for the first time after she's proved her worth in the Emerald Forest, and thus has to deal with Weiss's attitude as a result. Once that's resolved, the confidence she gains from that allows her to pass on that confidence to Jean during his own arc when he's feeling down about his position as a leader. Keep in mind that none of these moments happen either all at once or gradually over a long period of time. They happen on a case-by-case -case basis, because it's honestly a bit more interesting that way. To have an entirely new situation come up unexpectedly and then have to deal with it in a way that only you can fits Ruby's style so much better than a multi-season character arc, and thus our hero's characterization is stronger and more intriguing as a result. It's also just a much more lax and easygoing approach to characterization, which works well here because Ruby doesn't exactly go hard on its plot right from the beginning. In fact, I'd say the plot doesn't really kick in at all until the end of Volume 1. Unlike Volumes 5 and 6, where everything is overly serious all the time and the mission is always a top priority, this means that the characters have downtime to just exist and be characters. Remember when Ruby was a lovable dork that was so enthusiastic about her weapon and being able to fight with it, and wasn't the solemn, stoic leader type that just makes the right decisions all the time? Remember when she was allowed to act childish and immature? Remember when she had any personality whatsoever? Being reminded that Ruby used to be such a colorful and exciting character to watch is what makes current Ruby so frustrating because there's barely any downtime to just let her be Ruby and act like the dorky teenager she was set up as so early on. There is only a single moment in Volume 6 where we get even a slight glimmer of that and then afterwards it's gone for the rest of the volume. The early parts of this series are filled to the brim with strong characters organization. Yes, it can be extremely simplistic in its execution, but it is strong nonetheless because it never gets too overzealous with its ambitions and loses control. And I think a lot of decent ideas that early Ruby comes up with got swept aside by unobservant viewers. Which means that I guess we have to talk about... Retard. 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 Oh come on, Retard. now you're just being mean. Retard. Okay. 
please bear with me on this. I know it's sort of become a given that the bully arc was the worst part of early Ruby and that it was just a huge mistake all around, but if you're willing, I'd like to show you why we as a collective fandom might have overreacted just a bit. Is it a great arc? Fuck no. But I do think it gets dealt an unnecessary amount of hate because many people, myself included, just weren't paying enough attention the first time around. And my reasoning for this revolves entirely around Jean and how he is characterized in Volume 1. In many ways, Jean takes on quite a few different character archetypes and combines them into a more diverse entity. Sometimes he's the audience insert character used as a vehicle for other characters to dispense important information about significant people and the power system in this world, since Jean is kind of an idiot who isn't all that good at studying or combat or social interaction, etc. Other times he's used as the underdog character, fighting his way up to the top to prove that he can hang with the best of them, as per the same characteristics I just mentioned. However, and this is the big point right here that a lot of people seem to have forgotten about, Jean doesn't exactly start off as a great guy in general. Remember when he just shoves Pyrrha out of the way so he can hit on Weiss and acts like the big man on campus until he finds out who Pyrrha is? Not exactly leaving a strong first impression if you ask me. Sure, he has a set of morals that he sticks to, but he gets so consumed with his desires in the moment that he gets carried away and starts acting kinda rude. Now, with that knowledge in mind, combined with the fact that these characters still don't know each other very well and have some kinks to work out, as exhibited by Jean losing his temper with Pyrrha when she suggests she could tutor him, is there anything that horrendously bad about the bully arc? Is it the fact that Cardin blackmails Jean into doing his bidding? Well, that's just a simple blackmail subplot. Not one I'm particularly fond of, but the emotional logic makes sense across the board. Jean is trying to prove that he can hang with the best of them and is letting a sense of bravado get the best of him and prevent him from seeking outside help. So when Cardin starts blackmailing him, he refuses to ask for assistance. Pyrrha isn't exactly perfect either, and she lets her spat with Jean override her more logical side and allow the situation to continue without asking any pertinent questions. I feel like I shouldn't have to say this outright, but emotional teenagers are not the most logical people on the planet. Is it the notion that a bully that's this blatant about his bullying practices is allowed to continue on like this at Beacon? Well, clearly you haven't met a real-life bully in an uncaring school system. Yes, you could argue that Beacon should care more about the mental well-being of its students and try to stop such behavior, but it's also stated early on that Beacon is meant to foster independence and self-betterment. As Ozpin says in Episode 3 after leveling with the new students on how they should cast away their idealized vision of this school, he plainly states that it is up to them to take the first step. Beacon is not some happy world of sunshine and rainbows where the teachers are super invested in the well-being of their students. This is an elite institution for training huntsmen and huntresses. If you can't even stand up to a bully, then what hope do you have against the Grimm? I'm not saying that Beacon is right for maintaining this mindset, but that is the mindset that appears to be present here. Okay, but what about the scene where Jean is about to throw the sap at Pyrrha so Cardin can release the rapier wasps on her? That seems pretty awful, right? Again, you have to be cognizant of the emotions at play here and the personalities of the characters. Jean cheated his way into Beacon using fake transcripts. That doesn't exactly invoke an image of honor or loyalty, despite the historical figure he's named after. Jean is a loser who is desperate to prove that he isn't by playing huntsman with the big kids. This is the moment where he has to decide if he's going to continue his cowardly way of succeeding, or if he's going to straighten up and fly right. Obviously, he was never going to do the former, but that's what this entire arc was about. Jean was not a great guy, but eventually he found his way and got over the parts of his personality that were holding him back. Again, this isn't exactly one of the best character arcs of the series, but it does get much more hate than it deserves. And, more importantly, it stays true to the early Ruby formula of focusing on a single main idea with a single resolution, thus making its message and intent clear to those who see it. 
As for why this arc was so poorly received upon release, it might be due to how the series had been so extremely upbeat up to that point and then took an entire month of broadcast to cover a relatively depressing arc with one of the show's weakest antagonists. Honestly, I'm not sure, but what I do know is that it has greatly appreciated in value upon rewatch as a strong example of Ruby's more interesting take on character development despite its simplicity. Aside from characterization, having a less complex plot means that they can shove in as many cool ideas into that empty space as possible. And with Ruby, this is usually done on the visual end. Which brings us to... Oh, oh. Whoa, did you see that? How would I have missed that? I'm just gonna come out and say it. Animation was never an issue for this series. Perhaps my perception has been colored by a post-Kimono Friends environment, but I think most of us can agree that a show with bad animation doesn't make it unwatchable. Even outside of full CG series, bad animation has never stopped the show from becoming well-loved. I personally haven't seen it myself, but I can't count how many times I've seen someone recommend Baby Steps as a fantastic sports anime while also acknowledging its animation shortcomings. However, I do think there is an important discussion to be had about full CG animated shows, especially those with an anime aesthetic. To me, the most important factor in creating a full CG series is lots and lots of strong stylistic flourishes. Obviously, this is important for any animated series, but I find it especially important for CG ones because they are making a closer attempt at replicating real life. Even for a show that's competently animated and well-directed, like, say, Knights of Sidonia or Ajin, I'll still end up getting bored with it if its visual presentation is bland and uninviting, especially in regards to color palette. Everything just looks drab and lifeless, and when you're using 3D models, the last thing you want to impress on the audience is a feeling of lifelessness. In contrast, something like Bubuki Buranki or Expelled from Paradise, both of which are bursting with life and color in practically every moment, are much more palatable, even though their animation quality might be lower than that of Ajin or Knights of Sidonia. This is why Ruby still managed to catch on so quickly despite its animation quality being several rungs lower than all of the shows I've mentioned so far. It might not have been perfectly crafted when it comes to movement, but in terms of style, Ruby has all of them beat by a mile. It's not just that it's a colorful and lively series to look at, but also the sheer amount of creativity and inventiveness jammed into it to impress the audience. This might sound a bit cynical because of how people normally use this word, but gimmicks are a great way to start building a fantasy world and explore its possibilities. And when it comes to gimmicks, It's Also a Gun is pretty damn awesome. Just working off this simple premise, the designs for the weapons found throughout the series are given an infinite scope of freedom, yet also share a vague sense of unity to tie everything together. This is also why Ruby's animation upgrade after the fall of Beacon didn't really have that much of a positive effect. Yes, the animation quality is higher now than it was before, but it's not that much higher, so there isn't much of an appreciable difference considering that it's still fighting the uphill battle of being a full CG show. More importantly, when was the last time one of the weapons made you go, oh damn, that's fucking awesome? Because I honestly have no idea how long it's been. Maybe Raven's weapon, but that's mostly just a katana variant of Weiss's rapier, so it's not that impressive. That giant mech certainly wasn't very interesting because it didn't bust out the really cool stuff until the very end, and by that point it felt cartoonishly out of place. The designs in this show aren't even attempting to wow you anymore, and that's a huge problem because this was once an integral element of Ruby's design philosophy. Make cool shit that the audience will get excited about seeing. Of course, as I've said before, complex doesn't automatically equal better, and Ruby knows when to fall back on a more simple design sense, such as with the Grim. The structure of Grim designs basically boiling down to Grim mask plus black animal body was a stroke of subtle brilliance in many aspects. Having a unified color and texture scheme across all of the Grim makes their presence much more immense and frightening, especially when attacking in large groups. 
a swarm of unfeeling enemies to overcome. It allows for much easier design decisions while still managing to create something that feels unique and effective. It also provides a strong contrast to a certain theme established later in Volume 2. Ozpin notes that during the Great War, there was a movement towards suppression of art and individual expression, and those who fought against this suppression began to name their children after colors, a core component of art. This complex individualism contrasts the near-uniform appearances of the Grimm perfectly and makes the fight against them much more compelling. In terms of the basic presentation and structural components, Volume 1 was pretty solid, which gave the series a strong starting point to lead into its next batch of ideas. I regret nothing! I lived as few men dare to dream! Much like Volume 1, Volume 2 continues with the same structural mindset of making sure only one idea is focused on at a time. However, there's an added bonus this time around that wasn't available with Volume 1, that being that Ruby has now established its existence. This gives the franchise a lot more room to branch out to ideas that might be a little bit outside the realm of what's palatable for an initial audience. One of my favorite examples of this is in Episode 9 during the first Grim fight on their mission with Dr. Ublak. There's nothing especially creative about how the fight itself is structured, but the use of split screens adds a certain flair to the fight. We've already seen them fight this type of enemy before, so using a new cinematic element to portray the fight differently was a nice touch to keep the audience invested in an otherwise fairly standard fight scene. However, the real standout quality of Volume 2 was its tendency to go balls out on pretty much every crazy idea it could possibly cram in. Want to have a food fight with the students recreating their usual attack styles but with different types of food? Go for it. Have the characters explain the complex geopolitics of this world via a game of knockoff risk? Knock yourself out. A four-way information search that ends with them getting chased down a busy highway by a rampaging mech suit? Sure thing. A school dance focusing on the more personal and intimate sides of character personalities and relationships? Why not? A corgi that can be used as a projectile in combat? Absolutely. A search and destroy mission that uncovers the ruins of an underground city where the bad guys are loading up a train with bombs in order to break into Vale and let a bunch of Grim loose on the streets? Ruby, you had me at Underground City. This is what I imagine Ruby was originally destined to be for most of its run. A total free flow of as many interesting ideas and concepts as they could possibly work into the series that constantly builds on itself through world building, characterization, character relationships, and thematic intrigue. Keep in mind that the actual plot of Ruby is still fairly simple at this point. No maidens or relics to keep track of, no worries about who's gonna betray who, just good guys fighting the forces of evil, and evil forces doing their damnedest to get their way. And it keeps its focus dead center on whatever idea it's currently engaged in without trying to plan too far into the future or juggle too many ideas at once. However, there is one moment where Ruby breaks away from this mindset just for a little bit. Remember how I said earlier that there was one part of Volume 2 that did use a more complex plot structure with multiple goals being pursued at once? Well, there's a specific reason for why it does so that actually lends itself to a much more interesting thematic idea. Because Torchwick is able to get away after the mech fight in Episode 4, Blake continues to obsess over the White Fang and coming up with a way to stop them. While this is happening, everyone else is preparing for an upcoming dance. Romance is in the air and more inter-character relationships are being explored, but Blake becomes so consumed with her pursuit that she refuses to be part of the festivities and gets angry with those who she sees as not taking the White Fang seriously enough. It isn't until Yang intervenes with a personal anecdote about the perils of diving in too deep that Blake realizes she's in over her head and decides to slow down a bit so the stress doesn't do her in before she can even get to the White Fang. The first time Ruby tries to juggle more than one plotline at once, the narrative indirectly tells us that this is a bad thing and that the story, represented by Blake, is getting in over its head and needs to slow down for a breather every now and then. It's such a fascinating metatextual way of writing, which is something that Volume 2 does a lot now that I think about it, but that's a point we'll need to save for later. 
that's about all I have to say about Volume 2 specifically, so we should probably move on to the big one. The Great Destroyer has arrived. The end is near. The Great Destroyer has arrived. The end is near. The premiere of Volume 3 was an interesting time for Ruby. This was the first volume to come out after the loss of the show's creator, so prior to its release, there was a lot of speculation on whether the series could maintain the same quality and spirit it had before. Thankfully, this question was met with a resounding yes, as the vast majority of fans, myself included, hailed it as the best volume of the series so far, and it absolutely still holds up upon rewatch in most areas. Yes, there are quite a few subtle changes in pacing, humor, and cinematography that I don't exactly prefer, but their detractions from the narrative as a whole are mostly negligible. There is one prevailing notion that kept nagging at me throughout this arc, though. My initial reaction after finishing my latest rewatch was that the story they decided to tell for this volume is one that practically writes itself, and all they had to do was fill in the blanks with cool shit to get us from point A to point oh god everything's on fire. However, that's a rather immature way of looking at things. It's not like they literally pressed a go button and the story wrote itself. Even a story this well-known in structure has to be handled with care, and it definitely was in Ruby. Instead, I think what I was actually getting at was, this arc doesn't take any huge risks. Yes, I'm aware this arc permanently killed off two fan-favorite characters, but that's not what I mean. Ruby Volume 3 was the most tightly written part of the series by far. The tournament takes all of the best tournament tropes from past works and revamps them in a way that makes the vital tournament feel fresh and exciting, yet also familiar and comfortable. Every piece of Cinder's plan fell perfectly into place without any major plot discrepancies or Diabolus Ex Machina moments, and those are certainly accomplishments to be praised. That being said, of the three volumes in the Beacon Trilogy, I'd say that Volume 3 probably has the fewest ideas overall. I do love its socio-political theming, which we'll discuss in depth in just a moment, and the introduction of mythology and its ramifications on the world was really cool. But compared to everything from Volumes 1 and 2, 3 falls just a bit short because it's constrained by a storyline that can't be bent or shifted that much to make room for more content. Again, I'm not saying this makes it bad, but it marks a definitive turning point in how the writing was going to be handled from here on out. The arcs were only going to get longer and more complex from here, and that is a bad thing for a series like Ruby, which we've already established as one that thrives much more on its in-the-moment storytelling and smaller, more personal resolution moments rather than multi-volume arcs with half a dozen setups and payoffs. The reason it still works in Volume 3 is because the few ideas that it does come up with are so strong on their own and so upfront in their presentation that they make up for the lack of variety, something that later volumes just couldn't manage. Speaking of strong ideas, Politics makes me so horny. While it was exploring many socio-political ideas from the very beginning, it wasn't until Volumes 2 and 3 and the extended presence of General Ironwood that these themes really began to take shape into much more complex ideas. Ironwood bringing an entire fleet halfway across the world just for tournament security sparks several heated debates amongst himself, Ozpin, Goodwitch, and Crow as to its necessity and the psychological impact it will have on the general populace. Iron Ironwood's excessive caution and penchant for putting strength first, versus Ozpin's more caring view on human nature and the effect that such an aggressive move would make on all parties involved, makes this a genuinely interesting topic to explore. What makes these debates interesting is that A, we can tell that Ironwood is a veteran with a wealth of experience, even though the plans he comes up with might not be the ones best suited for a more delicate situation like this one, and B, not everything works in favor of proving Ozpin right. Every time it looks like Ozpin's method is the better one, something goes wrong, and from Ironwood's perspective, reinforces that he was right all along. It's also important that Ironwood is never portrayed as a flat military stereotype. 
He doesn't exactly have a one-track mind, and you can see his genuine concern for the people he's protecting. It's just that he has a particular way of doing things that might not be the best for this situation. Ironwood's confrontation with Yang after Emerald deceives her into attacking Mercury also has some interesting implications. After the fight, Ironwood tells Yang that regardless of what actually happened, millions of people across the globe saw her attack an innocent student, and thus have already judged her to be guilty. Because there is no evidence to prove the contrary, that is the story he must go with. The idea that you are simply unable to change the minds of the people around you is a rather daunting one for a young student to face. One that is echoed at the end of the series when Cinder takes control of Atlas's robot soldiers and broadcasts their assault to the world, thus causing many people to turn against Atlas even though it wasn't their fault. Politically, this is an extremely complex situation for Remnant as a whole and one that I would have loved to see explored in greater depth. So, how did we go from this... The world saw you attack an innocent student. They've already drawn their own conclusions. ...to this. And it is my duty to uphold them, as only I have the wit and tenacity for such a task. Such wit! Such tenacity! Well, much like I've said several times already, there wasn't enough time given to Ruby's political ideas for them to be properly explored. If the Cordovan encounter had been broken up into smaller ideas that gradually built on each other over an entire volume, she could have been a strong opposing force to our hero's goal. One that explores the dangers of military fanaticism, and how someone who was once dedicated to protecting the people could be consumed by said fanaticism. But all we got Scott was an overplayed military stereotype that I'm pretty sure I wrote one time when I was in high school. I'm sure there are some more minute details of Ruby's degrading political messages that could be explored so as to explain why some ideas wrapped up nicely while others didn't, but my point has been made and we're still nowhere near the end of this video. We are, however, ready to move on to the next major step in Ruby's development. Before we dive further into this section, I want to clarify that I still very much enjoy Volume 4. It's still a good entry into this series because it remains so intensely character-centric and all of the plot lines remain entirely separate from each other, yet at the same time are working towards the same goal, reuniting Team Ruby. The idea that the team would be totally separated from each other, thus forcing them to grow in unique and interesting ways before reuniting is pretty cool, even if it's hardly original in any capacity. This volume also has the best grim design in the entire series by a long shot. The apathy and Goliath might be the most thematically interesting, but nothing beats the knuckle of E when it comes to pure terror. It even has some of the best insert songs from the entire series, with This Life Is Mine and Armed and Ready probably being some of my favorite songs, period. Volume 4 by itself is fine. However, much like I stated in the last video, nothing in this series exists by itself. Coming back to this volume after 5 and 6, it's pretty obvious that this was where the big shift in Ruby's structure and writing style were permanently cemented into the series going forward. There's really not too much explaining that I need to do on volume 4 specifically, because it's all stuff that I've talked about already. Since the story begins to focus on more than one major plotline at once, and those plotlines take several times longer to complete, there is less room for the story to squeeze in all the cool ideas it might want to experiment with. Everything is now solely about the overarching Salem plot and trying to set the world back to normal again. In theory, there's nothing wrong with this way of doing things, but it's immeasurably less appealing than a sheer force of ideas solidly executed one after another. In a sense, Ruby's grand ambitions in later volumes for large-scale, multi-volume arc structures ended up working against it. It forgot where its strengths lied and bit off more than it could chew, while also dropping many of the things that were great about the series in the first place. One of the most important being... Knock, knock. Who's there? You are. You are who? You are a dirty, dirty, just no. Ha, ha, ha. 
Once again, it's very weird to go back to the beginning of the series and see just how different everything was. But by far the biggest difference is how comedy was handled. Whereas later volumes are mostly dour and moody, occasionally sprinkled with out of place comedy, early Ruby was filled to the brim with as many jokes as they could come up with. It was just as much a comedy as it was action-adventure, and that makes a huge difference when it comes to how said comedy is executed. I briefly noted in the last video that Volume 6's humor felt very spastic and out of place, and this is entirely because Ruby no longer cares about its comedy roots and wants to focus mostly on its story, thus making the comedy an afterthought rather than a core element. You typically don't have this problem when you're writing a show that that's supposed to be at least half comedy because you're constantly trying to figure out how to fit good jokes into a scene. This also allows for the jokes to take much more time to develop and pace themselves out, thus leading to a stronger punchline. The opening joke of episode 9 takes a whole 15 seconds to execute from setup to resolution, lets up on the tension for a little bit before echoing the same punchline, and then moves on to a different joke. Humor takes time to execute properly, and early Ruby excels at taking it slow and steady to deliver on a strong punchline without getting too bogged down by unnecessary information. The type of humor that Ruby currently employs is also drastically different from what it started with. Aside from general gags, there are two distinct elements of Ruby's humor that are completely missing from later installments. The first is that early Ruby's humor was kinda dark. Oh! We'll break his legs! Freddy, no! Pira, I know I'm going through a hard time right now, but I'm not that depressed. I can always be a farmer or something. No! Ruby had a bit of an edge to it back in the day, and the fact that it was so cavalier about it only made it funnier. It's not that surprising that it had this dark edge, though, considering what company this show comes from. And while we're on the topic of Edge, can I ask a serious question that I'm sure a lot of people just forgot about? What the hell happened to this show's sex appeal? Remember when the characters felt like hot-blooded teenagers instead of soulless plot-generating automatons? When Yang was checking out all the guys while they were changing? When she grabs this dude by the balls? Did you remember that Emerald and Mercury had sexual banter? That there was any ounce of passionate romantic feeling being thrown around whatsoever? Kinda weird for a show that was supposed to grow with its audience to leave the more mature topics by the wayside as it went along, whereas in earlier volumes we could see legitimate sexual tension and holy shit did Coco just slap that guy's ass? Alright, that's definitely a best girl, 10 out of 10, would let step on me. And I know it's easy to write this off by saying Rooster Teeth has gotten more progressive over the years and wanted to avoid these kind of topics, but that's the easy way out and doesn't look at the text itself. The simple reality is that, much like Ruby's more deliberate humor, this aspect of Ruby's narrative was just forgotten about as the story grew more and more serious, devoting more time to intricate character interactions and complex plot structures rather than the more simplistic, humor-driven storytelling. Another notable element of early Ruby's humor that's even more important to the tone of the series overall is that the writing is so laid back about everything, often in a very metatextual sense. Discounting the plethora of references to other shows that Rooster Teeth has already made, you'll occasionally get some references to events or ideas that don't exist in the Ruby universe, but the audience is still fully aware of. Ruby's speech at the start of Volume 2 is probably the best example of this. Referencing the Gettysburg Address, Martin Luther King, and President Nixon in rapid succession doesn't make sense in the context of Ruby, but it's not striving for verisimilitude in that moment, or really most moments in this series. In fact, the sheer amount of metatextual humor in early Ruby seems to spit in the face of verisimilitude, signaling to the audience that these scenes aren't meant to be taken taken super seriously and just exist to be lighthearted fun. As a side note, referential storytelling kind of forms the core of Ruby's visual aesthetic as well. Ruby is very much a byproduct of the literary culture surrounding it. Obviously you could say that about a lot of works, but Ruby seems to go out of its way to embrace this idea. 
Why make so many visual allusions to fairy tales? Because it provides an easy jumping off point for a story while still remaining familiar, and it's also just kinda cool to figure out all the references that they work into the story. Why make Roman Torchwick look like the guy from A Clockwork Orange? Because it adds an extra layer of menace to his character while also informing us of certain personality traits he holds, and also it just looks cool. Why make constant references to anime, Red vs. Blue, and other Rooster Teeth projects? Because paying homage to past works is an important aspect of anime culture, and Ruby's writers understand this subconsciously, thus compelling them to replicate that idea in their own anime-inspired work. And also it looks cool. Having high-concept, intricate ideas that take multiple seasons to accomplish is fine in theory, but it isn't inherently better than just making something simplistically fun that will grab the audience instantly and hold their attention. Speaking of grabbing attention, I think it's about time we moved on to the other big reason why Ruby got so popular. I would say that was the Calvary, but I've never seen a line of horses crash into the battlefield from outer space before. If I had to pick the number one selling point of Ruby amongst people who were discussing the series when it first began airing, it would definitely be the fight scenes. Which makes it so much more disappointing that the current fights in Ruby aren't even in the same galaxy as the ones from earlier volumes and have drastically fallen off in intensity. Yes, the fight scenes in Volume 6 are probably the cleanest and best animated in the series, but as I've already discussed, that's not what drew people to Ruby in the first place. They didn't like the fights because they were super clean and tight, they liked them because they were insane, explosive, and most of all, creative. For me, there's a big difference between a clever fight scene and a creative fight scene. Especially in something like Ruby, where the fights are such a huge part of the show's appeal. A clever fight scene is one where the heroes have to find that one singular weak point in an enemy and use all of their strengths to exploit that weakness and win the day. This can be most clearly seen in the giant mech fight in Volume 6, where Ruby defeats it by going inside the cannon while it's charging in order to destroy its dust fuel. In contrast, a creative fight would be, holy shit, did that girl just turn her grenade launcher into a hammer, use a piece of a bridge like a seesaw, fly through the air like she's riding a goddamn sailboat, and then curb stomp a giant scorpion, all in the span of about 15 seconds? Or, hot damn, did that girl just use another girl's weapon as a slingshot to shoot a third girl holding a fuck-off huge scythe into the air at the bird the size of an airplane and then have that girl run up the side of a cliff until she chopped the giant bird's head off? Or, literally, this entire food fight sequence? That's what I'm talking about when I say that early Ruby has creative fight scenes. They were much more about using as many interesting ideas as possible rather than crafting something well-balanced or perfectly paced. Less carefully meter out tension and release, and more this dude uses a staff that's also a pair of nunchucks that are also guns. Gunchucks. Even the environments that the fights take place in have been drastically scaled back. In early volumes, we have rooftop fights with people firing down from the air, a big shipyard filled with giant crates that get thrown around, a cafeteria where everything in it gets used as a weapon, a cramped office space that requires a more held back fighting style, a bottomless pit with massive stone pillars and bridges spanning across it, a system of highways and overpasses that everyone has to run around while getting chased by a giant mech suit, etc, etc. Then, starting with Volume 4, we get an abandoned town square, another abandoned town square, a big room with nothing in it, an open cliff face, and another open cliff face. Do you see the problem here? Most of the fight locations in later volumes are basically just big open areas with nothing in them. The Blake Ilya fight is pretty much the only one post Fall of Beacon with an environment that truly makes use of its surroundings for an interesting fight. There are even moments where it seems like the show is actively trying to shut down creativity. In Volume 6, rather than use the train tunnel as a moment to experiment more with the fight scene going on, they instead use it as a way that they can pause the fight completely until they can get back out to the open area again. This decrease in environment complexity also ends up doing a number on the fight's pacing as well. 
The end of the Tyrion fight has this bizarre pacing issue where it feels like Ruby's attack just comes out of nowhere after a few seconds while everyone just stands around doing nothing. Because we, as well as all of the characters, can plainly see where everyone is in a given fight scene, there's less opportunity to work in the surprise of a character coming back into the fight. Objects that work as cover or barriers separating them from the rest of the fight are easy ways to segment the action into different chunks and hide the character from your mind's eye. You subconsciously think, I know they're still there, but I don't know exactly where, which makes their re-entry into the fight much more impacting. When everyone's just standing around in an open field, it makes you wonder what the hell they're doing when someone else is fighting and why they're just standing around because you subconsciously recognize that they're still there staring at the fight. There's also the element of movement to take into account. Not how the characters move in the fight scene, but rather moving from one location to another. Even before Ruby, Monty rarely kept his fight scenes in a single place, and it adds so much to the tone of these fights. That extra layer of motion gives them a sense of constant gain and build up until the final climax. Moving from a small dust shop to the streets to the rooftop, or a highway to the abandoned area beneath it, or from a train to the city streets makes them feel bigger and more intense, if only by a little bit. But that little bit is all it takes, along with just adding more variety to the fight as a whole. And, of course, the weapons are also a huge factor in these fight scenes because they offer such a wide variety of fighting styles and scenarios to experiment with. When was the last time you thought about the it's also a gun meme? That was a pretty huge selling point when Ruby first started airing. Not just the element of surprise upon its initial reveal, but also the inherent flexibility of combat that comes with transforming weapons. It's such a cool tidbit to know that Ruby is able to swing her scythe around by using the momentum created when firing from the other end, but more importantly the dual nature of big fuck off scythe plus high impact sniper rifle makes the combat infinitely more exciting to watch because you're always curious as to what kind of strategy will be employed in a given battle. Sure, everyone can swing their weapons at insane speeds in volume 6 and you can even see each individual swing and the camera can capture the fight from all these cool angles, but at the end of the day it still comes down to two people in an empty box swinging their weapons super fast. And I can get a competent version of that and even the most mediocre of anime. What I can't get elsewhere is something like this. Which is why it's so disappointing to see Ruby completely give up on having creative fight scenes chock full of crazy ideas. Yes, the Adam fight was flashy and stylistic but the actual movements in that fight were just three people in an empty box swinging their weapons really fast and occasionally punching each other. Nowhere near the level of any fights from the Beacon trilogy. Okay, I talked about the structure, the characters, the animation, the humor, the fight scenes, and each volume individually, but I feel like I'm missing something. Something absolutely essential to Ruby's identity. Now, what was that exactly? Oh yeah. I hate you! And I hate the bands you like! I've already done an entire video on how Ruby's soundtrack contributes to its narrative, so I'm not going to go over much of that here. Rather, I want to focus this time on the sonic end of the tracks, as well as their implementation in the show. Now, take a step back for a moment and think with me about something. What is it that you actually like about Jeff Williams? The first answer that comes to mind is probably he writes really awesome rock tracks. And that's a valid reason for liking the music in this series, but for me it goes much deeper than that. I can get awesome rock tracks pretty much anywhere. What I can't get anywhere else is the sheer variety of genres and styles that Jeff is able to master. Think about the songs in each of the first four trailers. An acoustic guitar backed by strings, a piano and vocal performance with orchestral accompaniment, an electro-rock track, 
and a techno remix of the first three. It wasn't until this will be the day that we got a taste of Jeff's pure rock side for this series, and that sets some pretty high expectations going forward that Ruby manages to outpace over and over again for quite a while. Volume 2 is easily the most diverse and interesting across the board. The traditional Jeff Williams sound on Time to Say Goodbye and Die, the seemingly disco-inspired Shine, the big band funk of Dream Come True, a Motley Crue-esque ass-kicking on Caffeine, the passionate and emotional simplicity of All Our Days, the poppy romance of Boop, and the sinister foreshadowing of Sacrifice combined to create a lavish and exciting audio experience. Volume 3 follows this up with some strong and diverse entries like Not Fall In Love With You and Neon, but falls a bit short of the first two OSTs in that department. Even Volume 4 manages to keep up this trend with the warm embrace of Home and the light poppiness of Bumblebee. And, as mentioned earlier, This Life Is Mine and Armed and Ready are easily two of the best character tracks ever written for this series. Though I should note that the first three tracks for this volume aren't exactly hot compared to previous works. It's in Volume 5, however, that we really start to hit a snag. The Triumph is okay as a traditional Jeff Williams hard rock track, and Ignite brings some much-needed spice with its horn work and choral harmonies. Plus, it's always great to hear another Lamar Hall rap. Then we hit Path to Isolation, which on its own isn't terrible. It follows the same soft opening that grows into a harder rock track like we saw on Like Morning Follows Night. After that comes Smile, which is also a soft opening that grows into a harder rock track, but with a really lame percussion opening. Then we get All Things Must Die, and despite the sinister edge that Salem's presence gives it, it still follows the soft opening that grows into a harder rock track formula. That's three songs in a row with the same general structure. After that, we get a straight hard rock track, followed up by the worst ballad the series has produced since Wings, and then it's over. Aside from Ignite, absolutely nothing grabbed me about Volume 5's OST because it just repeats itself too many times for it to be memorable. So what caused this sheer drop-off in variety? Well, unsurprisingly, it was the narrative. On top of barely having any humorous edge to it like it used to, the more congested state of the narrative doesn't really lend to much tonal freedom on the whole. There's no space for a quirky dance number like Shine or an exhilarating techno battle like the one Neon plays over. Everything's too serious and hyper-focused on all the extensive plot lines it's trying to accomplish in such a short time frame. As a result, the prevailing tone of Ruby as a whole is everything kinda sucks now and we have to defeat the big bad as quickly as possible. And there's only one kind of song that fits well with this tone, that being the generic Jeff Williams sound. And I use the word generic purposefully here. Armed and Ready is not a generic Jeff Williams song because you can tell how perfectly produced and expertly structured it is on one listen alone. But Path to Isolation, Shine, and All Things Must Die aren't nearly as genius or genuine. Thus, they come off as generic. I'm not saying Jeff put less effort into these songs. I'm saying it's incredibly difficult to craft three full-length rock tracks in a row that are all supposed to have the same feel to them without getting repetitive. As for Volume 6, we only have some incomplete tracks to work with so far, but much like Volume 6 itself, I'd say they're on their way to being somewhat better than 5, but not by enough to make it count. I will say that Lion Eyes and Nevermore are the huge standouts so far because their lyrics are so strong and they're banking on a plotline that's been building up for over three years, which makes me even more disappointed that they cancelled Adam so soon before his character could truly become memorable. So there we have it. I just spent probably an entire hour explaining that, despite the current state of the franchise, Ruby actually was good at the beginning, often great in many areas. Its earlier volumes still stand as strong pieces of media that you can go back and enjoy just like you did the first time. And yet, 
there's still one really important point that I've only mentioned in passing. Something that dictates practically everything about what Ruby was. Something so fundamental to this series that even amongst the dozens of topics I've already discussed, I felt that this one deserved its own video. Continued in Part 3 Special thanks to Jan Rogalski, Rourke Tenjoin, Christine Seibert, Tim Johnson, Call Me Cat Lord, Ember's Fave Roommate, Eugenio Mendoza, and all my other patrons for their generous support. My name is Ember, and I'll see you next time.